My name is Ken Miller. I'm the director of Bayless Public Library. I'd like to welcome you all to this very unique event today. And I have a few thank yous uh, to give and then even more thank yous to me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Penny's Kitchen for the, the um, refreshments and Carl Stutzner who brought them here today. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate that very much. And I'd like to recognize one of our board members, Melissa Bellavender, is here today. Melissa, thank you. And I'd like to thank our staff for all the hard work that they've done to make this kind of thing happen. Uh, moving all the, all the tables, they actually uh, got the men's new Hope House guys in here to move the stuff around and, and arrange things. And at the last minute, Susan ran out and don't tell anybody, but she cut the roses from our own flower bed. <laughs> so, uh, but it's really pretty. Uh, but what we're really here to do today is to say thank you to each and every one of you that donated to this effort to, to restore this, this chart of Lake Superior. Bernie Arbick, Susan, and I were looking through the archive one, uh, several years ago and we, we saw these maps that were rolled up on top of filing cabinets and we we're pulling them out and we found a lot of things that you know you've seen on your school yeah your school pull down maps that aren't they're not really remarkable or anything and we found uh what was that map from uh, uh of the the downtown that with the other map we found was from 1890s I think? 18 1850 ish uh map uh, of downtown area and then we found this little tube sitting in the corner behind the filing cabinet and we pulled it out and opened it up and th this this was in it this chart was in it and it was all crinkly like this and pieces were coming off it we couldn't quite figure out what it was and and we finally decided figured out it was a chart of Lake Superior and looked at the date and it was incredibly old so we wanted to figure a way to, to see if these two things needed conservation. So we sent them, uh, actually one of our staff members took them to the Bentley Historical Library in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan. And they <coughs> said that this one needed conservation and the other one didn't. So the other one just came right back and they kept this one uh, for I think two and a half to three years they had it. Uh, and originally they said it would cost over six thousand dollars to conserve this piece of paper because they had to, to, to just work in by hand uh, an adhesive because this was coming off the backing so we asked people just sent out letters asking people to donate to help us conserve this this map and we, we raised uh, sixty five hundred dollars just by asking and, and many of you uh, supported us uh, at, in that effort. And again, we want to say thank you for that. Uh, turned out then the, the Bentley said, uh, well, we figured maybe it's going to cost less. Maybe it's only 3000 And when we finally got the bill, it was like thirteen fifty. Oh, wow. So I sent a letter back out to everybody saying, you know, it wasn't as much. Would you like your money back? And not one person said that they did. And, and so we're going to we take that extra cash and use it to enhance our archive. And again, thank you all for that very much because it means a lot to us. We, we do have to apologize about one thing. We did say that we would, we would have for you a facsimile of the chart uh, and we would have it at this event. We did have Mike Lucier uh, uh, photograph it and, and Surrealism is printing it, but they had to back order the paper. And so we don't have those available today. We will have them for you though. I do have a proof of the small size. This is the small size, small size. It's half size. Is it right side up? Yes it is. On paper that's not quite as good as it should be. And, but to me, this is just really great paper. So this is the small size, and only two people opted for this size. Everybody else wanted the full size that is fully six feet long. Wow. Surrealism will give uh, a discount on framing for that and mounting for that. So if you want to go to them uh, to mount your chart, uh, you can do that. So again, thank you all for your donations. 
And I'd like to recognize Kathy Chenoweth, the president of our board, who just came in. Hi, Kathy. And uh, so with that, uh, Susan, did I forget anything? I don't think so. No? You can come up after Amber's presentation and look at the chart uh, all you want. We have it under plexiglass. Please don't bring any refreshments up there uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, Amber Clement, who, had, who is our reference librarian, uh, really spent a lot of time researching what this chart is. And originally I thought it was a, a chart that a mariner used. Uh, I'm not sure, we're not sure exactly where it came from, but she has information on what she found in her extensive research, and she's going to present that to you now. Amber? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to start off with here, it's, uh, we're doing the history of the Survey of Lake Superior, and this is Lieutenant Henry Wolsey Bayfield, and he was born in 1795 in England, and he uh, had an extensive career in the Royal Navy starting at age 11. So uh, he, was, he was in the Battle of Gibraltar and in the War of 1812. At 22 in 1817, he was placed in charge of the surveys of Lake Erie and Huron with only one assistant, the Philip Edward Collins. Uh, during this time, the Rush Bagot Convention regulated the size of the Navy uh, forces on the Great Lakes. The Royal Navy, and they had some financial reasons, only sent Bayfield and Collins in a very small crew. Uh, Collins wasn't experienced, um, but they were provided with two eight oared open boats named the freighter and the Onondaga, and with only six weeks of provisions. Uh, they chartered 20,000 islands in Lake Huron, and the Indians named them Great Chief Bayfield and Little Chief uh, Collins. In the winter, when they were surveying, they were on the shorelines and lakes were done in the ice. And Bayfield slept in a buffalo robe under the mainsail in all kinds of weather. And he is quoted as saying in 1832, I had no room even for a mattress, but slept in all weathers in the boat's mainsail, thrown over a few branches placed on the ground. Many a night have we slept out this way, when the thermometer was down to near zero, and sometimes even below it. Yet even this was not so wearing as trying to sleep in vain in the warm nights of summer and the smoke of a fire to keep off the clouds and mosquitoes, <laughs> which literally darkened the air, fatigued as we generally were from sitting from sunrise to sunset in our open boats. And when this occurred, the ague or other sickness was sure to make its appearance among us. The crew su suffered from the ague um, and scurvy. Bayfield, in a letter to a uh, friend, John Harris, uh, discussed his illness the ague, he had to lie down in the bottom of the boat till the shaking fit was over, after which came a burning fever and thousands of mosquitoes who deprived me of a moment's sleep. They then proceeded to survey Drummond Island and the islands between it and Lake Michigan, the Lake Chenault Islands, en route to Penetagoshini, which they made their base headquarters and provision post. It was in 1823 that the Admiralty gave the orders for Bayfield to survey Lake Superior with his assistant, Collins, and the International Boundary Commission, who was out on the lake, um, factored into the Admiralty's decision to, to send them out to survey it. Uh, the Secretary of Admiralty, we have no vessels on Lake Superior at present, yet it is possible at some future period they may be required and the navigation of Lake Superior, we are extremely ignorant. Even the Northwest traders pretend to little knowledge of the lake beyond the coast. Bayfield is provided with a schooner, the recovery from the Hudson's Bay Company to survey Lake Superior. It was still quicker to use the two small boats for surveying and the schooner was mainly used for supplying provisions and making runs with the chronometer. Bayfield is issued strict instructions regarding his, ba his behavior as commander on the, uh, by the Commodore Barry, who held the command at Kingston. His responsibilities to the crew and ship were not to suffer your people, to sleep out, exposed to the night dews. Always pitch a tent to windward of swampy places if possible. 
Avoid sending your people to work on shore without their breakfast. Avoid unnecessary communication with Americans. And if an American soldier objected to the survey on American shore, not to persist in doing so, but to communicate with me on the subject as early as possible. If you fall in with your commissioner for surveying the boundary line, you are to afford them every assistance and information in your power. He also uh, reported on the species of timber and collected specimens of ores and minerals found on the shore. Uh, he, very ca he was told to be very cautious not to give the least offense to the Indians you might fall in with and recollect that from them you may obtain correct information of the productions of the country, course, and extent of the rivers and the best fishing stations. It was uh, June 20th through the 23rd that I found evidence he was here in Sault Ste. Marie in 1823. He stopped for supplies on the recovery and he most likely had dinner with the Johnsons because the Canadian boundary survey was also here in the Sioux at the same time. Joseph Della Field was the surveyor. Uh, this was a very busy time for, for Lake Superior. Uh, he had the Canadian and American sides out surveying for the boundary lines. In 1824, Bayfield stationed at his winter headquarters at Fort William in Thunder Bay. Bayfield rec recollected in a letter, we are cut off entirely from society after we reach Lake Huron, particularly female society, for six years. On Lake Superior, we are in winter not within 600 miles of the settled parts of the country and can only receive letters from our friends in England once in six months. Also assigned to the International Boundary Commission was John J. Bigsby, a doctor and a geologist who kept a detailed journal of everything geology. Uh, Bigsby remarked in the, his book, The Shoe and Canoe, if I may state not, it was under the lee of one of these islands that we espied the trim schooner, the Julia, which that was incorrect, they note that, in which Captain Bayfield was surveying Lake Superior. We exchanged news and civilities for a few moments and passed on. Captain Bayfield had been employed on this surface for three or four years without a sick man among his crew. But that summer, government supplied him with a medical officer and half the ship's company were shortly laid up with illness. <laughs> <laughs> also published in the, sun, uh, the Shoe and Canoe was uh, James Basir's map of Lake Superior, which I'm showing here. Um, I think that he got a lot of information with Bayfield. They kind of collaborate a little bit. On, on this map, and it uh, shows a lot of the detail and, no and notations of islands and rock deposits. They spent three summers circumvading Lake Superior, surveying Isle Royale and the Apostle Islands. In September of 1825, the St. Mary's River Survey and other islands and rivers were completed. Bayfield is, is again once in the light and most likely in the Sioux and uh, you can see through uh, the detail here on the next map it's a close up of it he uh, outlined the village of both Sioux St. Marie, Michigan and Sioux, Ontario. You can see the different buildings there. And it was October 1825 Bayfield returns to England in the fall and spends two years completing the charts of the three lakes with Collins and Frazier who's the draftsman. Uh, these include three charts for the St. Mary's River and Bayfield suffered from a liver complaint from the previous winter which the doctor said was by stooping over your drawing a table and studying late at night. So he was working very busy on these surveys. Later on in 1845, uh, it was a New York commercial advertiser uh, on the correspondence of Livingston. It was July 12, 1845 quoted, nevertheless, some 20 years later, an American visitor to Sault Ste. Marie com commented on the importance of Bayfield's survey of Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. At that time, copper, was mine, copper mining was being developed by American company, and the visitor reported that the only correct chart of the entire coast of Lake Superior is that made by the British government under the able superintendence of Captain Bayfield. 
and to this hour the only map used by the Ordnance Department at Washington and by then Superintendent of the Mineral Lands at Porter's Island is that of Bayfield. It was uh, in 1827, because this map was uh, completed in 1825, in 1827 the first steamer, Independence, was on Lake Superior, so only within a few years. And in 1828, the Admiralty charts were made available to the public. Uh, that was a catalog published first in 1825, but uh, for a mere three pounds, one could, beginning in 1828, purchase 28 sheets covering most of the Canadian Great Lakes with soundings, coastal reliefs, and notes on the nature of the shore. In the uh, 1850s, this period was one of the most interesting in the history of Lake Superior navigation. Masters sailed without charts. The lake was still largely unexplored and unsounded. Captain Alexander McDougall, working several steamers throughout the Great Lakes, noted that the only reliable map was one made by Lieutenant Bayfield which had very few soundings and even so it was hard to get copies of it. All the time I sailed the lakes I never had a chart in my hands. Bayfield's map was the only one of any value for Lake Superior until the period just prior to the Civil War when George Meade of Gettysburg fame made another survey in 1856 and that is from uh, Grace Lee Newt's book Lake Superior 1944. It was in 1867 that Bayfield was promoted as Admiral, and in 1877, uh, after 50 years of Bayfield's charts being used by navigators of the Great Lakes, a new survey is requested after the loss of the SS Cumberland somewhere between the Georgian Bay and Duluth. And in 1885, Admiral Henry Wolseley Bayfield dies in Charlottetown, Charlottetown Town, Prince Edward Island. His uh, staff commander, Bolton, upon hearing of his death, wrote, The Admiralty Surveying Service has produced good men from Cook onwards, but I doubt whether the British Navy has ever possessed a more gifted and zealous surveyor as Bayfield. He had a marvelous combination of natural talent with tremendous physical energy and was, I feel, convinced a man who would have gained the summit of any profession he might have honored for his thought was for his work. Of the 215 total charts of the Admiralty, 114 or 53% are attributed to Bayfield. So he did a very extensive career charting the Great Lakes. And now we're going to come a little more to somewhat present, 1930. Uh, Carnegie Public Library purchases a large map on cloth of the Lake Superior region from Alden Labonte the great-great-grandson of John Johnson and Susan Johnson uh, through their son George Johnson. There is nothing in the minutes of the purchase and the director at the time, Alice B. Clapp, was an avid historian. Uh, at, as Bayfield was out on the lake in 1822, uh, George Johnson was uh, living in the Apostle Islands at La Pointe and he was trading with the Indians. Also at this time in Sault Ste. Marie, Schoolcraft is assigned to Sault Ste. Marie as the U.S. Indian agent. So my thought is, is that they somehow were, were given this field map and have kept it here and then was donated later to the library or purchased by the library. So where did the map come from? Uh, the U United Kingdom Hydrographic Office of Admiralty was to has told me that it does not match their record of that chart and that some charts were sent to the Canadian Hydrographic Office in 1912. Well, the Canadian Hydrographic Office called me and they have no pre-mass produced printed version of the chart, nor do they know of the charts that the UK Hydrographic sent. So they're both have no idea. Neither knows where the originals are. The findings, we know that it was donated by Alden Labonte, a descendant of George Johnson. There's no official British Admiralty logo on any of the three sheets. Sheet numbers and pricing are not listed like that from the British Admiralty printed charts show. 
The three sheets of the chart are taped together respectively, sheet one, sheet two, and sheet three. There are four different ink and pencils marks on it. There's the main ink, which is original. You can see the stroke marks. They're from light to dark, like running low or the pressure of a person's hand on, on the paper. There's faded red ink used on the compass and it overlaps the main black ink. There are penciled in names of places. The main location of penciled in names is in the Keweenaw Peninsula and possibly this map could have been used for copper mining. Uh, resources have stated that this chart was popular for those looking for mining in the Upper Peninsula. The fourth ink is in the upper right hand corner with the name of Lucy Newcomb. Um, I haven't found very much out on her and it has a date of October 24th, 1906 and 1906, 1825, which I'm thinking is her birth and death date would make her 81 years old. So I'm not sure what this little uh, marking is up here. The style of the main black ink is inconsistent to a printed version of the chart. The penciled in names do not appear on the official Admiralty printed chart as well. The fleur-de-lis is a hand inked on the compasses. On sheet one, they are one particular style, most likely associated with Edward Collins, who is known to have done the inset of the River St. Louis. The other sheets show a different style. Also, the fleur-de-lis is not consistent with what is shown on the official British Admiralty printed chart. There is no shading on the coast on the, this particular chart like that shown in the British Admiralty chart. Um, my, my evaluation of this is that several working field charts were going on at the same time. He had his crew go out and the, uh, with the, the surveyors on the lake and uh, they had field maps which would have been redrawn on one sheet and then turned over to an engraver for publishing. So um, my thought is that the chart most likely may have been given to uh, Henry Schoolcraft or George Johnson and uh, by the surveyors on their way back through the rapids when they began the survey of the St. Mary's River chart. The final finished chart went on to England for the British Admiralty have engraved and printed for purchase. In uh, repair, in the restoration, they uh, re-adhered re loose and torn pieces. This is a map, this is a picture of it before the restoration. And a paper and digital copy will be available here for research purposes. And the chart will, the original chart, will be loosely rolled in uh, archival tissue into an archival tube for storage. Anybody have any questions? Yes. So there's Bayfield near Potoski. Is that named after yep. him? There are many places that named after Bayfield. He also surveyed the St. Lawrence Seaway and a lot around P Prince Edward Island. So there are also names of him up there as well. So, so you think this is one of the survey charts that, that uh, Bayfield's uh, crew used? Is yeah. Correct? Yeah. A working field chart. And they already had the final copy. You know, what are they going to do with the extras if they came through here? and so we could have really used that chart, you know, okay, hand it off. And we, we know, you know, Schoolcraft was the Indian agent. So. Who knows? Exactly. All speculative. Amber, thank you very much. That was very informative. And again, for those of you who donated $250 or more, uh, you will receive a facsimile of this chart in the mail as soon as... Uh, um, surrealism gets the paper and prints it up for us. In the meantime, uh, this ends our presentation and if you would like to look at the chart, it's here under plastic. Please help yourself. There are refreshments over there. Please don't bring the refreshments up to the chart though for obvious reasons as I said before. And thank you all very much for coming today. Can I have another question? So you have the, yep. the original map out here that we're taking a look at today. Um, when we all clear out later on today, that's going to be rolled up and put away. That's correct. Um, and then you had that facsimile in your hand, the photograph, that smaller one. Are you, are you going to have 
a copy that will be on display here in an ongoing basis? We've talked about that and I think what we were going to do, I'm not certain yet, I think we're going to put one of the full-size facsimiles under plastic like this and leave it on a table for everyone to see. That would be wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. But we haven't quite come to the conclusion of how we're going to make that happen so it's we're sort of talking about that but there will be a facsimile for anyone to look at closely scholars certainly could could look at the original we don't want to take the original out very often obvi for obvious reasons uh, and we have the digital copy that will be uh, available too for people who really want to to use that so so we're we're trying to cover all bases that way can i just point out too you see the, the logo here up in the right hand corner underneath the, the bar for the the lengthwise there. There is no logo on this. And that just kind of shows that this never made it to the Admiralty. Because otherwise so that logo is of the Admiralty yeah. printing office, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if you can see the difference between this is a printed version of the map from the Admiralty and then what than what this is. You can see there's uh, the shading differences again and and the logo and the way the compasses are drawn. So there is a difference. <coughs> Sir, do you have any other charts before 1900 in your collection? Not that I know of. Sorry, I mean, Jesuit one in the book, but no, it's not a chart. Yeah, it's not a chart. There, there's a facsimile map of the um, portage route, the Voyager's route from Montreal to Sault Ste. Marie in the Jesuit uh, relations that we have, which was printed in 1885, uh, or in the late 1880s at any rate. Uh, but it's a copy. <coughs> and that's all really all we have. Okay. So, yeah, I wish we had. <laughs> Further questions? Great. Well, please enjoy the refreshments and...